Hello there. Today I want to talk about the process of historical research using the example of pre-colonial Iroquoian population statistics. Now to begin with, the subject of pre-colonial population estimates is hotly contested. You do a little bit of reading on the subject and you find that it's a mess. We take the Iroquoian population statistics. We don't know for certain how many people there were at the time. Johnny, conservative American nationalist historian, he's going to say that the Haudenosaunee, there were only a couple of thousand people, right? Maybe 2,000 tops, because Johnny, American nationalist, has an agenda, right? If the Haudenosaunee were only a couple thousand, then they were insignificant. Thus, colonialism is good, right? Whereas Johnny, AIM activist historian, right? He's going around saying that the Haudenosaunee, there were several hundred thousand, because... He's also got an axe to grind, right? He wants to make the point that we were every bit as significant as the Europeans across the pond, right? And to the common man, population size is a marker of significance. And in between those two, you got a hundred different estimates, all based on something incomplete. I want to talk you through how you might go about estimating these populations. So first off, you look at history. That is the study of texts. So you go back into the, the writings of the period and you try and find something relevant. So for the Haudenosaunee, there are no good early sources. The first Europeans that the Haudenosaunee had contact with were the French, and the French made themselves enemies right from the get-go. So there aren't a lot of early French texts which are relevant to the Haudenosaunee, excepting the times the Frenchmen went to war. So there's basically nothing. I want to set aside the Haudenosaunee population for a second and talk about another group, the Wendat, the, the Hurons. Unlike the Haudenosaunee, the Frenchmen made themselves allies of the Wendat. The French had fairly extensive interaction with them. The Jesuits went up amongst them trying to convert them. Now, because, of, because of these friendly relations, we got a decent little bit of writing on the Wendat from the early contact period. So Champlain, wanting to know the, the people he made friends with, right? he went around and started asking questions. Well, how many villages do you got, right? Uh, how many people do you think there are per village? And he came back with the number, okay, there are probably about 30,000 Wendat. Now later he changed this number to about 20,000. We don't know why, right? Maybe he misremembered or maybe he changed his mind, right? This, that, or the other. Could have been either. This number on its own is not particularly reliable. Champlain is not the best source for a lot of things, right? He's not as bad as a lot of explorers, but he's got some issues. We don't know for certain how Champlain arrived at this number of 30,000 or maybe 20,000. So the statistic by itself, it's just a data point. It's not entirely reliable, right? Now, I've got a policy with regards to historical research. When you're dealing with scant evidence that Extraordinary claims require extraordinary evidence, but unextraordinary claims require unextraordinary evidence. So if, for example, Champlain says they wore mittens, that's a pretty mundane claim. I don't need a lot of evidence for that, right? It's pretty unlikely that Champlain would get that wrong. Now, population statistic, that's Champlain himself might be unreliable. So we have a, a little while later, the Jesuit writer Sagard did his own population estimate. So he went to a couple of villages and he asked around, okay, how many villages do you got? How many people do you think there are in that village? How many do you think there are in that village? And from that, he calculated that there were between 25,000 and 35,000 Wendat. Now, based on the writings of the two authors, I consider Sigard to be a better source than Champlain. Champlain has a couple of issues. Sigard has relatively few. This would give us better evidence, except that we, again, don't really know how Sigard arrived at this number. It could be that he took his number from Champlain's number, right? He read Champlain's work and, okay, Champlain thought there were about 30,000, so I'm going to quote that there were about 30,000. This is, again, better evidence, but it's not really up to snuff. There are holes you can poke in the evidence here. Now, the next relevant writing on the subject was a detailed census by the Jesuits about 10, 20 years after Sigard. The Jesuits wanted to know precisely how far they'd come along in their process of converting the natives, right? They wanted to know exactly how many more we got to do. 
the Jesuits went village to village. They went themselves village to village. They counted all of the houses. They counted all of the fireplaces. They counted everybody they could get their hands on. And they asked around for those people who were out hunting. So they, can, they went and conducted a very detailed census. And the number that they came up with was about 12,000. Now this Jesuit census is pretty good evidence. Because the Jesuits talked about their methodology. Well, we went and counted it all. There are this number of villages, there are this number of longhouses, there are this number of fires, and there's this number of people. They also don't have a lot of reason to lie. Now, a lot of the Jesuit stuff is sort of propaganda to send back home. But this, I have no reason to believe, is propaganda. Right? They want to know how far they've come along. It doesn't do to exaggerate it, because that's unproductive. Right? If you report that there's more people than there are, then there's going to be a, a, an invisible, imaginary portion of the population that you're never going to be able to convert because they don't exist, which means that your mission is never going to be done. And if you underreport the population, then when you go about converting, you're going to miss some people. You're going to miss some real people. So the Jesuits, it was in their interest to be as accurate as possible so that they didn't miss anybody in their conversions. So this later Jesuit census, it is pretty exceptional evidence for there being about 12,000 Wendat at the time of the census. Now, this 12,000 obviously is not the same as the 30,000 quoted by Sigard, except when you compare it against the historical record, you find that this census was taken shortly after the first major smallpox epidemic among the Wendat. So it stands to reason that their population was diminished. How much were they diminished? So you go look at other First Nations and you try and find some where the population demographics were known. So some of the some of the groups out west, they weren't contacted until the late 17, early 1800s. Now in the late 17, early 1800s, there were a lot more white people around, there were a lot more literate people around, so there's a lot more writing around. So we have a fairly good idea of how the first wave of smallpox affected a certain number of groups. So from this we can take a sort of average mortality rate of the first wave of smallpox. Based on my own just cursory research, seems to be about two-thirds, right? Some people had a little bit more, some people had a little bit less. Generally, it was about two-thirds. So if we compare the 25,000 bottom end estimate of Sigard against the post-smallpox census, we can see that the post-smallpox census is a little bit less than half of what Sigard's 25,000. This mortality rate would be a little bit low compared to most first wave smallpox epidemics. However, it's within the range. If we instead take Sigard's 35,000 and we compare that to the 12,000 post smallpox census, we get about two thirds, which is almost right on the average mortality rate. So in doing this comparison, the post smallpox 12,000 seems to verify the pre-smallpox 25 to 35,000. So we've taken Sigard's semi-unreliable source and compared it against a quite reliable source, and we found that they align, right? Thus reinforcing Sigard's. It's now no longer just dubious evidence, now it's relatively convincing evidence. Right? Now that in and of itself, it's not it's still not perfect. Right? You do have to do some speculation, some leaps, but Comparing the two, you can say that, okay, this is probably true. This is probably the ballpark. So what else can we do to either reinforce or tear down this number? Well, we've sort of exhausted the history at this point. There's not really a lot more that you can add to this, just because there's not so very many sources. So what else can you compare to this? Well, you could compare the oral history, except the oral history isn't useful in situations like this. The oral history tends to concern itself with events and the cultural zeitgeist of the time. It doesn't tend to concern itself with little piddling details like numbers. So oral history is not really any use in comparing populations, except for maybe trends. It might talk about a time of prosperity, which you would expect to coincide with a population increase, or a time of war or famine, which you would expect to coincide with a time of population decrease, but it doesn't but it doesn't help you with actual numbers. So what else can we use to build our hypothesis here? Well, we've also got the archaeological record. Now, the archaeological record isn't directly useful. You can't just 
dig up some skeletons and say, okay, there were 12 skeletons here, so that means there were 12 people. Right? It doesn't work like that. Most of what you're finding, archaeologists miss a lot of what there is. Right? If there's only 12 skeletons, it could mean most of them were rotted away. It could mean they were buried elsewhere. It could mean that there were only 12 skeletons to begin with. Archaeology can mean everything or nothing. So what people have to do is, again, take comparisons. So I recently read a study by G. Warwick trying to calculate population statistics by looking at Huron archaeology. What he did was he took all of the archaeological information from all of the Huron sites in southern and central Ontario. He started looking at the statistics between them. Now, South Ontario um, is pretty heavily developed. Most of South Ontario has been clear-cut and farmed at various points. As a result of this, we know most of the archaeological sites. I think the paper estimates that we found more than two-thirds of all potential Huron sites. So that's a fairly significant sample size. It's not perfect, right? We, it could never be perfect, but that's fairly significant. It looked at the information from each of these sites and compared a number of variables. So he took all of the sites and he sorted them by date, and he took the area of each site, the square footage of each site, the square footage of each longhouse, and he took the number of longhouses, and he took the number of fire pits in each of the longhouses. So he took all of these various statistics, which don't mean a heck of a lot on their own, and he combined them all and compared them against certain other known variables, variables, and he extrapolated for the unknown information. And from all of this, he deduced that the population for the, the Huron, the, the Wendat, at the time of contact was about 32,000. Now, this number, conveniently enough, is within the range of Sagard's estimate. If we were to simply take this archaeological research by itself, it's again relatively flimsy evidence. It's an excellent study, but there are any number of reasons why it could be wrong in one way or another. But when we compare this study against Sagard's estimate, we find that they coincide very nicely. So the archaeological evidence points to there being about 32,000, give or take a couple of thousand. And Sagard's evidence points to there being between 25 and 35,000. So the archaeological evidence fits nicely into Sagard's evidence, which is backed up by the later census. So you've got all three of these pieces which fit together nicely. None of which are very compelling on their own, but when you fit all three of them together, they complement each other nicely. They all sort of say the same thing. We can say with a fairly high degree of confidence that there were probably about 30, 35,000 Wendat at the point of contact. Now having established that the Wendat numbers from the Jesuits are fairly reliable, we can then use this data to try and answer the question of the Haudenosaunee. The Jesuits also did a bit of looking at the surrounding peoples. So Jesuits went to the, the neutral people, the Atawandaran. They did a, another cursory study estimate, and they said, okay, there's probably about 40,000 of these, these neutral people. Now, this sort of makes a bit of sense. South Ontario, the territory occupied by the neutrals, it's got much better soil and growing conditions than traditional Wendat territory, so it makes sense that there would be more people than the Wendat. So about 40,000, that sort of makes a bit of sense. Now the Jesuits also said that of the three great powers around Lake Ontario, the Haudenosaunee were the least numerous. So the Jesuits estimate that there were slightly fewer Haudenosaunee than Wendat, right? Now, this number by itself is not terribly reliable. The Jesuits didn't have very much first-hand experience with the Haudenosaunee in this period because the French had made themselves enemies. There's also the potential of bias. The Jesuit sources, they were probably Wendat scouts, right? Okay, how many people do your enemies have? Oh, yeah, they're nothing to worry about. They're, they got slightly less people than us, right? Talking about an enemy, the Wendat might not have been entirely honest, right? So there's reasons to doubt these numbers. Now, unfortunately, as mentioned, there's basically nothing in the way of good writing on the Haudenosaunee at the point of contact, right? There's basically no first-hand sources besides Champlain describing how he was shooting at them. So we don't have a lot that we can compare this to. Now, there are some later writings. Um, the Dutch went and did some calculations, this, that, and the other, but they did it at a much later date. So they did it post-smallpox, but also they're unreliable because a lot was going on in the world at the time. 
So there were two studies similar to the, the Warwick study. One of them was done by D. Snow, and it looked at Mohawk populations specifically. The other was done by E. Jones and looked at population statistics for the other four nations. I have some issues with the Jones study, but the, the Snow study I think is fairly good. So I'm going to separate the, the Mohawk out and just talk about the, the Mohawk specifically. The Snow study found that there were probably somewhere in the vicinity of 8,000 Mohawk at the point of contact. I, again, this study has got a couple of issues. It's not perfect, so it's not tremendously useful on its own. So it needs comparison against some other data points. Now, we don't have any good historical data points, but we do have one not so good historical data point. Namely, the Jesuits thought that there were slightly fewer Haudenosaunee than there were Wendat. Except that this doesn't tell us how many Mohawks there were. Right? If we take a little bit less than 32,000, let's say 30,000. 30,000 Haudenosaunee, how many of those were Mohawks? So now we draw in another data point. The oral tradition tells us that the most populous of the five nations was the Seneca, then the Mohawk, then the Oneida, then the Onondaga, and last the Cayuga, who were much smaller. The number of seats on the Grand Council sort of reflects this, right? Firstly, the Onondaga have got the most seats because they have special significance within the story of the Peacemaker. After that, the Seneca had the second most because they were the most populous. Now after that, the Mohawk and the Oneida both had the same amount, and then lastly, the Cayuga had the least because they were the least populous. So I took that 30,000, and I divided that sort of based on how many seats each of the nations had. And then for the Onondaga, I just put them halfway between the Cayuga and the Oneida. From that 30,000, if we divide it the way that I did, we can say that there were maybe about 7,500 Mohawks. Now my little thing is just a 15 minute thought experiment, it's not meant to be any kind of definitive evidence, but it compares fairly nicely with the archaeological evidence. So seven and a half thousand, that's not far underneath the eight thousand put forward by the, the Snow paper. We can attempt to fix this by bringing in the Jones paper. Now the Jones paper says that actually the Seneca were not the most populous, the Mohawk were the most populous by a, a fair margin. So maybe I underrepresented the Mohawks in my little comparison. Right? It could be that the, the oral history is talking about at the time of the Great Law, the Seneca were the most populous, but things might have changed by the time of contact, right? So maybe my number should be a little bit higher. And if you put seven and a half thousand a little bit higher, you get, you get closer to the number estimated by the, the snow paper. So again, you're taking a number of problematic data points, none of which are tremendously useful on their own. But when you compare them, you find which ones hold true, right? And if you can get a number of these unreliable data points to sort of support each other, all of a sudden you've got a halfway decent data point, right? Anyway, this has been a long, long little ramble. I hope you found this interesting. Um, thank you.